So just got this one mic on, so good deal. All right. So yeah, we, we can just come together, worship together, study the Word of God together. We don't need any show. We don't need anything fantastic. Is this blinding somebody? I'm going to turn it a little bit. Uh, how about that? Is that better? All right, thank you. I don't want you all to go blind from this. But it does help. I've been spoiled now, Mike. I got light. I've been enlightened. But it is, it's nice to be able to come out and worship you, the Lord, in spirit and in truth. And uh, be able to open our Bibles up. I, keep a, I kept a notebook for many years. I still uh, I kept one up. I still have my own notes now, but it's good to be able to keep up with that. And you've got some PowerPoint points there as well uh, that are in our service today. And we basically, I had this morning's Sunday school message, and this message was one message. But it was just a bit much to cover, so I split it up and made two services out of the same original message. So you'll see a little uh, carryover from this morning. So I'm going to ask you to go ahead and, if you haven't already, turn to Romans uh, chapter 3. We're going to finish that this morning. Now Romans, the book of Romans, I've seen the book of Romans do two things. I've seen it grow a church, and I see it empty a church. I have. Because when you get into teaching the Word of God and you get into seeing that people are not going to be impressed by what God sees in them, they're kind of turned off from church anymore because they always like to feel good about themselves. Well, God doesn't tell you to feel good about yourselves. He tells you to feel good about Jesus Christ and then for Jesus Christ to fill you up. And we don't really get that fully until we start to mature some in the faith that there is a no good thing, as Paul said, that dwells in us that we don't want running our life for us. We know that we're supposed to stay away from the biggie sins. We know that. But it's, uh, it's the little things that end up slipping us back away from God, not just the big things, the deception that we're okay we're doing all right. We, God wants us to see that Jesus Christ is all right. And His Word is all right. And we need to zero in on that. So it can become a challenge. And I, I encourage you not to let it distract you uh, as you're learning and going through this book. We'll soon go into chapter 4 next week. When we finish chapter 4, we will have finished you know, a fourth of the book. I think there's, what, 16 chapters in this book? I should know. But we have a lot to learn, and we've got, we've got a long ways to go and a short time to get there. No, this is not Smokey and the Bandit. <laughs> but let's pick this up. Romans chapter 3. And I entitled this message, What Can You Exchange for Your Soul? What can you exchange? What can you exchange? What have you got that God needs? What have I got that God needs? Verse 23 says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. That's the answer to our sin. Justified freely. We look at that this morning. We don't earn that justification. But we're justified freely by His grace, His unmerited favor. Through the purchase price, the blood of Christ, that's the redemption that was paid where He bought us out of the slave market of sin. Never to be put up for sale again and set free. That's all those three points there are involved with the word redemption. There's agorazo, it means to buy in the market. From the word agora, which is the word for market. For man is viewed as a slave sold under sin and under the sentence of death. Romans 6 and verse 23, where it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So that's agorazo, the word for redemption here. One of the words for redemption. The, to man is seen as a slave sold under sin and under the sentence of death. And subject to... But also at the same time being made subject to God's purchase price of redemption by the purchase price of the blood of the Redeemer. 
And so he go, the Redeemer walks into the marketplace and he buys you out of the marketplace. That's agorazo. He's taken you out of the marketplace and he purchases you and removes you from further sale. You can't lose your salvation once you accept Christ as Savior. The Bible is very clear about that. No one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. And speaking of the finality of the work of redemption, another term that relates to redemption is the word lutroo, and it means to loosen or to set free. He sets you free that you might respond to him and afterward show devotion to the one who's delivered you from the, from the enslavement of sin. And then he takes you on to live in the Father's house. When the end of your life and your service for the Lord is past in this world. What a wonderful thing. There's nothing we can do to exchange for that. Just say thank you Lord and follow the Lord. Let's pray. Father we ask you to bless the word and our understanding of your word this morning. That you give us wisdom and knowledge. Help us to understand that what we are, we are by your divine grace. That we deserve no favor of something that we have done by no merit of our morality or our gifts or our talents or our personality or our gender or our uh, race that we come from. That we are all equal at the cross and all must come through your grace, through Christ Jesus our Savior. We pray that people will understand this as we are in this section of our study on justification in the book of Romans. Help us to understand it. Father, we do pray for our nation. We pray for those who are suffering because of those hurricanes and the damage that was done. We ask for your mercy to be upon them and for those who are there on the ground helping. And Father, we pray for our nation that we will understand that it's not about who you're picking for president, but who you pick for your Savior. We pray, Father, that we'll make the right choice when it comes to our elections. But we know that we cannot fail when we pick Jesus Christ as our Savior. Our ultimate deliverer and ultimate redeemer. So help us to make our right choices about what we do politically. But also make us, help us to understand that we have a choice to make that has to do with the deliverance of our fallen soul, that we'll receive Christ as our Lord and our Savior for the complete forgiveness of our sins, for the complete annihilation of all condemnation because we're in Christ Jesus. And may we learn and have the humility to follow you by faith. We pray for our church, our church family, for the needs that each one has here, physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually and financially that we'll lean upon you and trust you and trust your word to give us guidance in all those areas. Help us now, Father, to, to get the distractions that are in our mind and in our emotions and in our thoughts. Help us to put those distractions aside, this preacher as well, and to focus on your word this morning. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. God's attitude towards sin is absolute. We'll see this. Because He proved that His attitude towards sin is absolute when Jesus came and died for us on the cross. That God's attitude towards sin is absolute. That His attitude is without change. God's attitude is immutable. As you see in your notes, which I did not put on the PowerPoint presentation for this morning, is that cultural norms change and moral norms change in a society. But God does not change. Culture has to come to God's point of view. God is not going to go to culture's point of view. God is not going to shift His point of view on godliness and holiness versus ungodliness just because people's points of view change over time. God does not acquiesce to apostasy. People would wish that He would acquiesce to apostasy. 
that he would change his mind on what is right and moral. But he will not do it because our God is an absolute God. You can absolutely trust Him. You can absolutely trust Him to deliver you to heaven. If you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. You can absolutely trust that God will do that. That God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. That whosoever believes in His Son shall not perish but have everlasting life. You can be assured that God is absolutely going to keep you because He says He will keep you because He is an absolutely God, absolute God who cannot lie. He does not change. God has never changed. He may have revealed more about Himself, but what He's revealed about Himself is righteous and holy. He is never going to change. You can always trust Him, but you can always trust that He is not going to change regarding sin either. Our society has changed. It's become very simple, as have many other societies. God does not acquiesce to the culture. Look what He did to Sodom and Gomorrah. He did not acquiesce. He blew them to smithereens. And God has different ways to blow us to smithereens. He's got different ways He can use to bring about our repentance. And as Job says, the rain falls upon the just and the unjust alike. When God has to judge sin, there is going to be collateral damage. There will be believers who will suffer too. Not everybody that went to Babylon was an apostate. Jeremiah was an apostate. Daniel and his three friends weren't apostate. They were true believers and followers of Jehovah. And they kept the commandments. They did more than just keep the commandments. They loved God. Deuteronomy 6 said that's God's desire that we love Him. Not just keep His commandments, but we love Him. But there are a lot of people who have turned against God and God has used weather-related events in the past to bring about a change of mind, hopefully with, about sin, with hopefully a, a corresponding change of action about living for God, living a holy, more holy life. I remember after 9-11, when the Twin Towers were flown into and almost 3,000 people were killed, how there was a rallying around the, the church is a little bit more. We never saw much here. There's something about the Word of God that just repels people who want to get to know God. Isn't that amazing? Just amazing. But a lot of people started becoming religious again. When we had the pandemic, people started trying to get all religious a little bit again. Well, Jesus doesn't want you to get religion. He wants you to get Him. And you do that through receiving Him as your Lord and Savior. But God is, wants you to become a Christian. He's not going to change his norms and standards about what's right and wrong. He's going to burn. He's not going to take your salvation from you if you get into sin. He's just going to take you to the woodshed. If he has to. He doesn't want to, but he will. Cultural norms change and moral norms change, but God does not. The culture has to come around to God's point of view because God is not going to come around to the culture's point of view. God's just not going to do it. He doesn't need it. God is not lonely looking for a friend. He didn't create Adam because he was lonely. That's the dumbest thing in the world. He was lonely, so he made people. What kind of an idiot theology is that? God didn't make. He made Adam so he could show his glory through mankind. Made it work for a little while. Yeah, a little while. <laughs> Our personal faith in and acceptance of Jesus Christ, of course, is necessary to be reconciled to God. So he provided himself as a sacrifice to redeem us from our sin as a way to reconcile us and rejoin us to God the Father. Jesus made the ultimate personal sacrifice. It was demanded by the Father on the Father's behalf for his holiness reasons that we might be brought back into the family of God, the only way that God could do it without violating His perfect integrity. God can't let you into heaven. Flesh and blood shall not enter into the kingdom of God. You've got to be saved. 
The offering that Jesus Christ gave up for sinners, the word propitiation, the losmos, is a picture of an offering that is made. The offering that Christ made for sinners was His shed blood. He died on the cross. He gave His life for us. And it wasn't just His blood. The Bible says in Hebrews, uh, Isaiah chapter 53, that He gave His soul as a ransom for our sins. This life-giving sacrifice on the part of the sinless Son of God made manifest to the world of God's righteousness as a payment for our sins. And God saw to it that that payment that He made was made publicly. It wasn't behind closed doors somewhere where he went in and prayed, paid a price behind closed doors. He was openly exposed and shamefully put on a wicked, rugged cross. In the Old Testament, their sins, as we get to verse 25, they were sins that were passed by. In other words, they were put on hold. There was a remission. They weren't judged at that time. They were put on hold until Christ should come. And it was the forbearance of God that did that. The word forbear means he held back his full justice on those folks. He held back his justice. The blood of bulls and goats was just a covering for their sin. But it never satisfied the justice of God as a payment for the removal for sin. It was blood sprinkled on the mercy seat. It did not remove sin. It just covered it for the period of time. You see, the bull, the goat, the sheep, and the dove... That was for the real poor person who couldn't afford a goat, a sheep, or a bull. If you were really wealthy, you would have to offer up a bull or more. If you were a semi, you would have to offer up a sheep or a goat. If you were really poor, then you could catch doves. And when you would come to do the sacrifice often, those little doves would have been caught by merchants, put in little wooden crates, and as you walk through town to do your sacrifice, you know, you were a poor peasant or whatever. You could go in and purchase that little dove. If you didn't catch it for yourself, they had them there for sale. Get two for three dollars. If it been real bad, we'll give you a good deal. We'll give you four for five dollars. But they would do deals for them. They would help them. And the merchants would make a little money. They would have to offer sacrifice for their sins too. But the poor folks, God made provision for the poor. The poor were not given the excuse. They're not going to heaven just because they're poor. I've lived in hell on this earth. I've done been through my hell. I've been poor all my life. I know I get... No, that's just self-righteousness. God expected even the poorest of people to pay to have a, 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 that there would be, have to be a ransom for their sins too. So they would have to buy turtle doves. And they would offer them. And so they would be sold so you could have that to take up. But every way you would have it, there would have to be a sacrifice for sin. But regardless of all those innocent animals, and they were innocent, they hadn't done anything wrong. Could you imagine that bull or that sheep or that goat when you were walking out there with that knife and they're looking back at their friends and saying, what did I do that made him so mad at me? What did I do? You're being offered. You're innocent. And you're a picture of an innocent one that's a human being that's going to be offered for people one of these days. The bull, the goat, the sheep, the dove, they were all innocent animals. But the people who offered them to the priest, they were not innocent people. They were all guilty. Even the priest who would go in once a year to make a sacrifice and offer for the people, he had to make a sacrifice for himself first because he was also guilty. So what can we offer in exchange for our souls? Jesus asked in Mark 8 and verse 37. What do you offer in exchange for your soul? He asked. You know our works cannot hold back the justice of God. Because of our sins. Our religion cannot hold back the justice of God. Because of our sins. Our morality cannot hold back the justice of God. Because of our sins. And so the Father, according to Galatians 4, 4, waited until the time was right, and He sent forth the Son, born of a virgin, and He came to bear our sin as a sinless substitute sacrifice on our behalf. But He was not doing it just for us. He was also doing it for the Father, that the Father made it available that mankind could be restored to union with Him. That God wanted there to be union. He's a giving, benevolent God. He wanted there to be a union between us and Him. But it could not be done willy-nilly. It had to be done in a specific way. 
So Jesus, verse 26, where we pick up, I declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and that he might be the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. Jesus Christ was set forth as a sacrifice to declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him who believes in Jesus. This is the only condition for being justified before God. Okay? Verse point number three is that we can do nothing to satisfy God apart from Jesus Christ and accepting his sacrifice. It was Jesus that justifies us, humanity, before God. Muhammad does not justify humanity before God. The Buddha, nor Confucius, nor the Pope can justify a person before God. How dare somebody say that I declare that you are a saint? How dare? Only Jesus. Jesus is the only man on earth that can forgive sin. Because he's the God man that's called the hypostatic union. And now he's the high priest in heaven. And through the Father's plan, Jesus still forgives sins. Only Jesus can, can declare you to be saved. Only Jesus Christ can, can declare you to be a saint. Only Jesus Christ can be the one that enlightens you. Not the Dalai Lama, not the Buddhist, not the Hindu religion. They can't enlighten anybody. They just take you down to the devil's light, which is hell. So he says in verse 27, I declare, I say at this time, his righteousness, that he might be just, and the justifier of him that believes in Jesus. So where is boasting then? The moralist Gentile was boasting. The pagan Gentile says, uh, I don't care. I'm no worse than the rest of them. The Jew was boasting of his religion and his conscience and his morals as well. But Paul says, where is the boasting then? It is excluded. And by what law? Of works? No. Nay, but by the law of faith. So where is boasting then? We have no room to boast is the answer. Boasting is excluded. That is how I know I'm going to heaven because I gave a bunch of money to the goodwill. I gave a bunch of money to this. I went to church. I did this. I did that. That's boasting. Paul says, do you boast by the law? Do you boast of your works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Now, the word here is important. Nay, but by the law of faith. There's no definite article of the word the which identifies a specific reference that Paul is referring to. So when you have the word the before the, this noun or whatever, it's referring to a specific contextual faith. Nay, but by the law of faith, no definite article used here before the word faith. So it is by personal faith. It is only through the avenue of your personal faith can you make the decision to come to Christ in salvation. You have to have the faith to come to Christ. God does not give you the faith to get saved as the Calvinists teach. They teach a lot of good things. They're not Calvinistic in that regard. But in the regard of coming to salvation, God does not give you the faith to believe. He gives you the facts to believe. And God requires you to exercise your faith. Now, He'll give you a lot of facts. His Spirit will try to convince your mind to believe, but you're the one that ultimately has to say yes. God doesn't say yes for you as if He's just turning the switch off and on as He wants to. You have to believe for yourself. God's not going to believe for you. Only by our personal faith can the sinner come to salvation. Upon accepting what the Holy Spirit reveals to the sinner about being Guilty as a sinner as seen in John chapter 16 where it says there that the Spirit of God He makes manifest that which is sinful. And He also makes manifest our condition and who Christ is who paid for our sins. And He leaves it up to us. He leaves it up to us. So where is their boasting? Is It is excluded. We can't brag that we've been justified because only He can justify us or declare us righteous before God. Our works, do they declare, declare us righteous before God? Does our religion declare us righteous before God? No. 
But through faith we learn how to become righteous before God. And that's faith in Christ Jesus. Only by personal faith can a sinner come to salvation upon acceptance of what the Holy Spirit reveals about the guilt of the sinner. That faith must be in the Savior who made the sacrifice unto God for our sins. If Jesus Christ is not your sacrificial lamb, then anything you do for forgiveness of sins is unacceptable. It's like Cain bringing a basket of carrots to the temple as they had for the outdoor a tabernacle that they would build as a place of worshiping God. And God says, I don't want your carrots, I don't want your taters, I don't want your apples. Abel brought a more acceptable sacrifice. He brought a lamb from the field. God accepted his sacrifice because it depicted that there without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. It is unacceptable, like Cain bringing a basket of vegetables from his garden as an offering to God to exchange for his sins. God says, what you want to pay your sins with is not good enough. And people are turned off by that because of their self-righteousness. Exercising faith also is not a work. So God is not violating His just standards by you exercising your faith in coming to Christ. Your faith is in a credible evidence that's in Christ and the Word of God that talks about Christ and teaches about Christ and declares Christ. When you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you have put your faith in the one that God declares that will save you. What will you offer to God in exchange for your soul? What are you offering to God now for exchange for your soul? Do you think coming to church saves you? I hope not. Do you think being a good man or a woman saves you? I hope not. Do you think turning away from certain sins saves you? I hope not. It's nice that you may do those things, but you've got to accept Jesus as your Savior. You don't have to feel it, but you need to accept Him if you haven't already. So must I. So must all of us. We are only justified by faith apart from works. We are condemned if we resist this. Paul is saying that you're justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law in verse 28. Therefore we conclude. Why boast? Verse 27. Righteousness comes to the one who justifies you. That's in Christ. Verse 26. We conclude that a man, verse 28, is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. We conclude, the word conclude means to reckon. It's the word logizo and it's, a, it's an accounting term. We calculate, in other words, with certainty, indicative mood, that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. Or works as far as that's concerned. There is no doubt from Scripture that a person cannot be forgiven of his sins or enter heaven at death by his own effort, no matter how honorable he has lived. And I said something earlier when we first started in the book of Romans that it'll strip away our pride, it'll strip away our deceit. And for those of you who have been saved and you know you're saved, and you know through whom you are saved in Christ. These messages may seem redundant in some ways to you, but there are so many people who have not even considered the way that this book of Romans approaches redemption. It approaches redemption with the fact that it shows you that you're condemned. It shows you that you cannot justify yourself, that only He can do that. And it kind of leaves you naked, as it were, spiritually speaking. All the believing sinner can do, even up to his death, is acknowledge that he still has sin in him no matter how hard he's tried to be good for God. Because he's only going to be secured and saved in Christ because God honors his word to his son. Jesus Christ. He honors his word to his son to keep and save those that have come to Christ by faith. First Peter 1 Peter 1.5 says that we are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed at the last time. Jude 24 says, Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling 
and to present you faultless before the presence of His glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. Amen. Only God can save you and only God can keep you. And I was reading something from Donald Gray Barnhouse in my study in Romans chapter 8 this week. It was very telling. Especially for those of you who have been saved for many years. That in the latter years of your life, as he's going through Romans here himself, when he taught it years ago. A great expositor of the word, well-known preacher and, and writer. Conservative biblical scholar at that. He noted that as Paul reveals in Romans chapter 7, the, 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 art, the, the, the struggle that goes on in the spirit and the flesh is a constant in the Christian's life. And as you become more mature and more stable in Christ and more knowledgeable of God's word, you also conversely become more knowledgeable of your shortcomings. And you become more aware of of His grace and your utter inability to be good and pure all the time, whether it's in thought or deed or action. And as you get closer to the end of your journey in this world, it seems to you as if your failures become more magnified to you than when you were a younger, dumber Christian. You just didn't know how much an effect God had on you. And as you become more mature, you start... You could get discouraged and say, I thought by this time I would have been over these sinful temptations. I thought by this time I, I wouldn't have to be keep on confessing things that I was confessing 30, 20, 40, 50 years ago. I, I should have gotten over that by now. Well, the thing of it is, it means more to you now than it did. You haven't become callous. You've just become more aware and it's the sin nature's way of discouraging you down the last months or years of your life or decade of your life that you ought to just give up. I'm telling you, the older you get as a Christian, the more the sin nature is going to tell you to give up. You're no good. The sin nature will lead you to believe that why go to church? Why try? You're just no good. You'll just have to let God just do with you what He wants. Well, He's going to do with you what He wants regardless. But you can't forget what He's done for you and just quit church altogether. Just quit God altogether. Quit praying altogether. Quit reading the Bible altogether. Lose hope altogether. You're getting close to the finish line. I can tell you, it hurts. Those of you who have run in a race know what it's like when you get towards the end of the finish line. It hurts anybody that knows NASCAR. When you're getting to the end of the race, you've got to look at your gauge and see how much fuel you got left. Can you make it to the end? You're going to come in on fumes? I guarantee you, every last one of us will come in on fumes when we die. But God is doing a work in you as per... Philippians 1 and verse 6, and he's going to complete it. He'll do work on you until the day of redemption. And there'll be times you'll think, I'm no good. I thought I was a better man. I thought I was a better woman. I thought I could, I could lick this thing. You can't. All you can do is just surrender again and again and again and again. And don't quit surrendering to Christ. Amen. Confess your sins, 1 John 1 9. Confess it when you do wrong. You get willy nilly on something. First John 1 9. If we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He does that based on the finished work of Jesus Christ. We are not justified because of something we've done. And once you get saved, you're not going to be justified for something that you can do then either. It's something you've got to learn to live with. doesn't mean you learn to do it, but you learn to live with the fact that you're subject to failure. Some writers that I read would suggest that there's no way when you go into Romans chapter 8 that Paul is talking to a Christian because when you get into verses 4, 5, 6, and 7, it's as if Paul is saying, you know what? If you're carnal, you couldn't be saved. That's not what Paul's saying at all. I'd want to preach that sermon right now because it's hot on my mind. But I'm not. 
I'm going to read it though, because it is relevant to today. In Romans chapter 8, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the old sin nature. That's the word uh, uh, sarx, not soma. Soma, S O M A, is the basic word for the meat of the flesh and the bones. This is sarx. Sarkikos refers to a carnal state. Okay? There is no end time condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who walk not after the flesh or the sin nature, but after the spirit. That part of it is actually not in the original text. It goes up, it picks up in verse 4. There is no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus made me free from the law of sin and death. Positionally, but you still have to stay in fellowship on your own volition to practice it. What the law couldn't do is it was weak through the flesh, but God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that are that mind the flesh do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the Spirit, they mind the things of the Spirit. Present tense, continuous action. Because to be carnally minded is death. Carnally minded means you're not, you're not in fellowship with God. The unsaved are never going to be in fellowship with God until they are in relationship with God. This is talking to a Christian. That's temporal death. That's being in a state of carnality. Many Christians like Solomon who spent 20 years in a state of carnality. That's where you get your book of Ecclesiastes from. He was spiritual until he got big into britches and got wealthy and powerful. And then he started hooking up with all these women supposedly to make alliances with other countries. But then he started following their gods as a believer. You can follow other gods as a believer. And you'll lose every bit of your rewards. You can be carnally minded as a believer like King David. He had women on the mind a lot. You can be carnally minded. You shouldn't be. It's detrimental to your spiritual growth. It's detrimental to the glory of God. It's detrimental to your rewards. And it's called temporal death. The carnal mind is at war against God. And the older, as Barnhouse says in his commentary, it's a four commentary set on just the book of Romans itself. The carnal mind is at war against God. The carnal mind, it will not be subject to God's law, and neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh, that if you are a believer who is living carnally, you can't please God. And so I'm getting back to Romans chapter 3, we're wrapping up here. It gets tougher as we get older in Christ. And we just can just have a greater appreciation for our justification because it's through faith and not through our own efforts. That God has got you. There's no good deeds you can do. And because God has got you, that comes all the way back to you being born. Purchase out of the slave market of sin and to salvation is that you've been set free to worship. There might have been some period of your life when you know that you're saved and you're going to kind of do your own thing. And God's not going to let you go. You kind of had that in the back of your mind, on the back burner. But as you realize you're not happy following the flesh and following the materialism of the world, you then got tired of bragging about yourself. Pride of life. You start to have a deeper reflection and appreciation for who Christ is. The old saying is no fool like an old fool. Solomon said that he was supposedly the wisest man on the earth, but nobody became a bigger fool than he did. He said that of himself when he came to his senses. And all in a sense we've all in a way been prodigal sons and daughters. We know that. Not a darn one of us in some form or fashion hasn't been a prodigal son or a prodigal daughter. Who is truly saved? Doesn't make you feel any better about anything, but it's the truth. 
And this is where this passage helps us to have a greater appreciation for what Christ has done for us. And all we can do is say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> thank you, Lord. Like Paul concluded in chapter 7, where he says, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And I know the self-righteous person will say, as for Romans 7, 24, O oh, wretched person that you are. <laughs> A wretched person. Paul said, I am the chiefest of sins. I am what I am by the grace of God. Not a bit more. So Paul asked the question in chapter 3 and verse 29. He says in Romans, Is he the God of the Jews only? Is he not also of the Gentiles? Yes, of the Gentiles also. He asked this question in the light of what has been declared. Is he not also the God of the Gentiles as he is the God of the Jews? Because we know that God is not partial to one or the other. That God does not favor one or the other. That God is not impressed with your gift, one or the other. He is no more impressed with the gift of communication or singing or teaching than He is with those who say He has the gift of health or the gift of hospitality or the gift of grace and prayer, the gift of giving. There's a gift there for everything. He doesn't favor one or the other. He doesn't favor one group over the, over the other. The Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved in Romans 10, 13. Verse 30, Seeing it is one God who shall justify the circumcision by faith, that is the Jew by faith, and it is one God who will justify the Gentile by faith. It is one that's hothaos, definite article used here, masculine nominative singular of God. It's the God, hothaos, who justifies the circumcised, that is the Jew, only through faith. He only justifies you by faith in Christ. And the Gentile, he only justifies you through faith as well. So this faith is a big important part as you get to the end of chapter 3 when it comes to this doctrine of justification. And God has done all the work and all you can do is put faith in it. There's no merit on our part. Do we then, verse 31, make void the law through faith? God forbid the law was good. We establish that the law is good. That's what he's saying. The law of Moses shows us the vast gulf between the holiness and righteousness of God and the unrighteousness of man. That was its greatest purpose. So do we then make void the law? No, we don't make void the law, Paul says. He says, God forbid, he likes saying that. Yea, we establish the law. The word established, present active indicative of the Greek verb histomy, means we conclude. We conclude then in certainty. Indicative mood is, the mood is certainty. We conclude with certainty that the law is good. And how is it that it is? Well, the law shows us the vast gulf that's fixed between the righteousness of God and His holiness and the unrighteousness of man. But the law also shows us the need for a sacrifice that is acceptable to God. And that's only through Christ. Only He can bridge the muddy gulf between the unholiness of man and the holiness of God. And I will add this as we close this chapter, that as a believer... There is only the righteousness of God can span the gulf between when we sin and the holiness of God. Works does not re-energize re re our faith. It may be the result of a re-energized faith, but acceptance of what we are. As you get older in Christ, you come to accept what you are more so than you did when you were younger in Christ. I've been saved over 52 years, and I can tell you, Every year, I would think that I'm a, I should be a better man, but I don't feel that way a lot of times. I try, I confess when I need to, and I'm sure you do too, and you try and you confess when you, to God when you need to too. But the book of Romans just strips away any pride that you have and any effort of anything that you've ever done. But it also leaves you not empty, it leaves you an open vessel to receive all that God has for you. The whole purpose of stripping us down in this book is so that we might be ready for glorification. 
that we might be ready not only in glorification, but in this side of the life, to also have a sense of the fullness of the playroom of Christ starting to fill us up in the spiritual realm. And the intellectual, per se, and the physical realm have less and less impression upon us anymore. All so much people are impressed with the physical realm. They're impressed with the sounds and the sights, the smells. They're impressed with the energy. Embrace the energy. Embrace the joy. Receive the joys. I've heard some musical group is, is really presented that does this, this big, supposedly this big, fantastic celebration. And, and, and that's fine. It, it, but that is definitely not something that churches need inside the church. Because there's no doctrinal formula for their message. The doctrinal formula is not based on sound doctrine. But what happens is the wild, crazy music and the lights and all the things that goes with the production is to distract you from what they're not saying. And what ends up happening is that people end up installing that stuff because they see a crowd. Stupid preachers put that in their churches thinking, I'll do something similar to this because if they can get a big crowd with that big Jesus who ah who ah, maybe I can get a pretty similar nice crowd if I can make my little micro world like that too. So rip out everything, turn off all the lights, turn on the blue and the flashy lights, get the drums going loud, get the speakers bigger than the wall itself, and blast the little daylights out of your people so that they are then mentally turned off from thinking. They have been emotionally raped in their church. I'm going to say emotionally raped and extorted in their church for power for the preacher. And don't do a blessed thing when you walk out that door about Jesus Christ. Dumber than a bag of hammers. You know, the prophets in the Old Testament, when some Yehu came through with some Yehu thing that was got everybody at home. Oh, and Lord, this is great. The prophets were always the Debbie Downers. <laughs> Why you gotta be a Debbie Downer? Y'all, some of y'all know what I'm talking about. Not y'all not all that religious, I guess. Even the Bible has places where secular poetry and such is inserted into the inspired word of God, as per Paul and the book of Titus and other places. Of course, it would be somebody like Paul who was a man about town before the day. But the Word of God is supposed to keep our feet on the ground, not our heads floating up in the sky. The Word of God, for God, is down here. Nothing wrong with feeling good every once in a while. But just watch how you get yourself to feeling good in the name of Jesus. That's what I'm saying. I, I had... Uh, one cup of coffee this morning. I have too much made. And I did not drink it in the name of Jesus. I just wanted to wake up. Our faith alone in what He has done for us is the simplicity of the gospel. Jesus did everything, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. And we leave it at that. The law of Moses shows us the vast gulf between the holiness and righteousness of God and the unrighteousness of you and me, Jew and Gentile alike. When we come to Christ, we're now Christians. We're believers. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. But as I'm wrapping this up, as we get older, we start to see things more and more as Christians that we don't have as much then and bigger as we used to think we had. But we're more grounded in who Christ is. And He's more real to us than anything. And I, I, I'll tell you, there are a lot of people, when they look at the life of Jesus Christ apart from His miracles, they would not hang out with Him. They wouldn't hang out. A lot of people would hang out watching Jesus, what I call the outlier disciples of John chapter 6 and verse 66. They hung around with him because they liked the show that he put on. They wasn't doing it for a nefarious reason. He was showing them that he was God in the flesh. 
But they didn't see it from the spiritual realm. They saw it from the purely entertaining realm. That's why Judas hanged on and Jesus knew. Because he saw it from the entertaining place of power realm. Even at the Last Supper, the disciples, the better disciples, were asking, who's going to be first in your kingdom one of these days, Lord? When they knew that Judas was going to be betraying Jesus, they were still just thinking about number one themselves. Who's going to be first in your kingdom? Well, let's see. The first to be last, the last to be first. You know, something like that. Jesus always had a way of just stealing your thunder. And a lot of people don't like that. They just don't like being humiliated. Well, when Jesus went to the cross, He got humiliated on our behalf. And you all know that. So I would like to see if I have anything to say today as I close for the third time. <laughs> Don't mind being humble before Jesus. Don't mind being small before Him. Because the smaller you are, the bigger He looks and the more safe you feel. When you feel like you're all out in a bag of chips and you've got to do all the fighting for yourself and you, then you see how powerful the enemy is, you can get scared real quick. But when you see yourself as small and Him big and embracing you and protecting you and you're humble and you let Him rest, rest in His arms and His love and His truth and His promises, the whole world can jump on you and you don't care. Because you know He's got your back. You know He's got you. You're protected. That airplane flying at 30, 35,000 feet, yeah. <laughs> and I, some of you know what that's like. You think when you hit that first air pocket, Lord, this is it. This is done for. Something's rattling. The phalanges fell off the plane. Y'all don't remember that one, do you? You know when the Lord's got you, you just trust Him. You just feel secure about it. You get in your car and you go home. Whether you live in a townhouse, you live in a cabin, you live in a trailer, it don't matter. You just feel secure about it. Whether you've got a lot of money in your bank or you're just scraping by and don't know where your next, how you're going to get the next bill paid. The world's blowing up overseas and the politicians in this country have lost their mind. You can just wrap, let them know that God's got you wrapped up in Him and everything is going to be alright. Come you know what or high water, you're going to be alright. You're resting in His grace. You're trusting in Him. You know that He doesn't really expect too much of you. Just be honest. He doesn't expect that much of you. Not that you don't try. I don't try. But if you think that He expects a lot of it, you, then you've got a wrong impression of what you've got to offer. Because it's by grace. And when you have that peace, the legalist will say you don't care. The truth is, you're letting God care for you rather than you thinking you're taking care of God. God doesn't need anything you got. He just wants you to understand you need everything He has. What little bit we do, it's a reflection of what He's doing through us. And we just, need to, we just get to enjoy it and go along for the ride. So this week, enjoy the ride. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your grace, Your mercy to us. Thank You for being so kind. Thank You for filling Your will in our lives. First, it's saving us by us accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior for the forgiveness of our sins, for us giving up on that we're good enough to make it on our own because we realize we're not either by moral or religion or whatever. We know we can't deny that you exist because our conscience has told us well enough that you do. And so we're just thankful that you save us by your grace, you keep us by your grace. We're thankful that our salvation is complete that it is secure in Christ our Savior. And we're thankful that your plan for us may involve us getting snatched out of this world this week, if not by the end of the day. We just don't know. But either way, we know that we, you've got us in your hands and you're not going to let us go. We know that you are responsible as our Father. That you're not an irresponsible Father. You're not just God to us. You're our Father. Jesus is our Savior and brother. We're, we know He's responsible. We know that Your Spirit will not lead it according to error or according to cultural norms. That Your Spirit will not lead according to what's not good for us, but only for what is good. And we thank You for that indwelling Spirit. 
We ask God that you will bless everyone here. Bless those who listen online that they might realize that they don't have another moment that is guaranteed theirs. That they need to say, I know I'm a sinner. I know Jesus went to the cross and he died there for my sins. And I now personally accept him as my Lord and my Savior. I'm not waiting on a feeling. I'm accepting it. That request to you by faith. And I receive that salvation now by faith. And Father, I pray for those who receive Christ as Savior that they'll get into a place where they can learn the Bible and let you guide and comfort their lives. In Jesus' name, amen.